Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study with Chosen People Ministries. We're currently going through the book of Galatians and we've called it Rethinking Galatians. And uh, our goal is to try and look at it from maybe a slightly different perspective. This week we are in Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. And uh, we're exploring the idea that we are justified by faith. Now, Paul sees this whole um, thinking about being justified by faith as an expression of God's grace. Now, justification is just a very long word for describing what God has done for us, namely that when we put our faith in his son and what his son did for us in dying for our sins, something remarkable happens. There is a legal change in our status. We move from being an enemy of God because of sin to becoming a child of God. And justification is a legal term from the law courts. As we begin our section tonight, Paul will open with a statement that could at first sound a little obnoxious. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. When I first read that, I thought, ouch. He says essentially the same thing in Romans, but he gives a little bit more information. And uh, I'm going to read that to you. And then I'm going to tell you what I really think he's saying, because I don't think he's just being arrogant here. So in Romans 3, verses 9 to 10, we read, What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. So just as here in Galatians, Paul, this isn't about Paul being arrogant. I, I, I may have told you this, but there used to be a poster in uh, my flat when I was at Bible college that said, I don't know what annoys me more about Paul, his arrogance or his humility. But this isn't that. What Paul is trying to communicate is the truth of the gospel. So what he is saying in effect is this. Listen. I know, we as Jews know what we're talking about. We're talking about the story of salvation. The story of the Jewish people is salvation history. And what Paul understands is that he is Jewish because God sovereignly chose Abraham. And from Abraham, God called forth a people out of Egypt. It's probably worth pointing out that Paul didn't see law and faith as separate, as distinct from one another. So today, if I were to say Judaism, people think of a religion. For first century Jewish people, for them, faith, the law, the land, the people, it was all one. It was all rolled into one um, identity. The identity of the Jewish people is an identity that finds its meaning in the person of God. So his faith for Paul, well, put it this way, for Paul, perhaps his identity was that of being an Israelite. His faith was that of a Jew who kept God's law and his calling was fulfilling God's purpose for his nation in the world. So I think for Paul and Jews of the first century, ethnic identity and religious practice were actually inseparable. It's not like that today. What Paul wants to show is that there is a context to his argument. So let's take a moment and read what it is that Paul wants to say to us. Reading from chapter two and verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
But if in our endeavour to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were by the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Well, that's a, a, a bit of a theological tongue twister. But what is it that Paul wants us to see? He wants to demonstrate that he's speaking from a position of authority, a position of knowledge. And he's not going to use this against the people to bring them into spiritual bondage in the way that the circumcision party is doing. You see, the circumcision party were those who had declared that if you wanted to come into new covenant faith in the Messiah, then you were required to be circumcised. No, what Paul wants to show is that this is not only unnecessary, but it's actually wrong. It's the very opposite of the gospel and the very opposite of grace. So what we'll do tonight is take a look at what it means to be justified by faith. And I'm going to suggest that this isn't simply a New Testament theology, that there is in fact an Old Testament basis to what we call justification. And whether we're talking about in the first century, was there other thinking around this issue? Well, I've kind of been hinting at it, I think, already. But perhaps the place to start would be the depiction of God as the judge of all. Because it's in God's hand that the fate of man rests. And we see it in Exodus 23, verse 7. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and the righteous. For I will not acquit the wicked. <coughs> so although this verse is about something slightly different, the key thought is that it is God who judges and God who acquits. Now justification presumes that there is a judge who has the right to make the declaration of guilt or innocence. And the Mosaic Covenant presents God as the one who alone sits and judges between the righteous and the wicked. Now, I think we read in Job one of the most important questions in Scripture. Job chapter 9 and verse 2. Job says, Truly, I know that it is so. But how can a man be right before God? Job will wisely go on to tell us that even if he were to think himself righteous and blameless, the very minute that he even opened his mouth to say it, then he would no longer be righteous or blameless. How often have we said to young folks, there is no perfect church and if you find it the minute you enter it, it'll no longer be perfect. Well, it's the same kind of argument here. I wondered when I have read Paul if Job's question is at the back of his mind when he writes an answer to the question of how can a man be right before God. So this is what, what Paul says and we'll take a look at a couple of verses in Romans. And in Romans 8 verses 33 to 34 we read, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one to die. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. And then perhaps more succinctly, we read in Romans 5 verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained, we have obtained access 
by faith into this grace in which we stand. We're justified. But it's worth noting again that in Hebrew, it's a judicial term. It's a declaration that flows out of God's plan and God's actions and God's decisions. Often human beings are, well, they find themselves with a very deep need to be right, to be justified about what we think and why we think it, or why we act in a certain way. But I found a little something that I thought was quite useful. Um, one author wrote, the source of justification is determined by God. The act of justification is performed by God and the fruit of justification is produced by God. Job's question, of course, came from our perspective. How can we, how can I be right with God? But when Paul answers, he answers it from the divine perspective, God's solution to the question. And the solution is Jesus, the one who died, the one who rose, the one who paid our debt for sin, the one whose sacrificial death is all about redemption and all about atonement. And ultimately, as Paul points out, he's the only one who listens to any charge that's brought against us. But in actual fact, the only voice he listens to is the Lord, his father. He doesn't listen to what the world says about us. He doesn't listen to what Satan says about us because the source of our justification has been determined by God. It was God's determination that Jesus would die for our sins. The act of, of justification was performed by God in the person of his son when he went to Calvary. And the fruit of justification is produced by God. The fruit of obedience. The fruit of commitment. So, where was I? Yes. What's interesting about this argument is that uh, back in Galatians chapter 2, last week we looked at Paul's very public rebuke of Peter. And of course, Peter had um, got a little bit intimidated by these from the circumcision party and had pulled back from fellowshipping with the Gentile believers. And Paul gives him really quite a, a, a rough time. And I think it's interesting that the debate about justification by faith through Jesus comes immediately following his rebuke of Peter. Now, it's worth, I think, remembering that Paul's goal for the community in Galatia is the same as his goal for us. What does Paul want them to understand? But what does Paul want us to understand? And what's, a, what's a, the issue here is it's the relationship between faith and works. Now, I think I said in our first session that for Jewish people in the first century, the entrance into the people of God was by birth. So you came into uh, God's covenant through the Abrahamic covenant, that is through birth, but one stayed in the covenant through works. Now, that is a particular view of first century Judaism that may or may not be um, fully accurate. What is true is that in the first century, Jewish people believed that they were the people of God by birth. It was a an entrance into it. Now, I don't think they believed that they stayed in covenant relationship uh, or they remained the people of God if they obeyed God. Because you see when God disciplines the children of Israel, he sends them into exile and he brings them back. And he never says, you're no longer my people. He 
reveals his hurt, his pain, his anger. And at times you almost hear him so frustrated he would happily cast them off, but he can't because he loves them. And that's not his character. He's, he's faithful. And so it, it may well be though that in the first century, there was a, um, a developing understanding that the evidence that you were a member of the people of God was through your adherence to the Torah. Um, but people in the first century absolutely understood that their responsibility to keep God's law flows out of a relationship with God. This means, I think, that contrary to popular opinion, Jewish people in the first century did not have a works-based faith. It was a faith-based relationship, and it was an expression of God's grace. His chesed, his loving kindness, which was extended in the past to the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, and now Paul says is being extended to the Gentiles. Paul opened this discussion by saying that he wasn't a Gentile sinner. So it really is worth asking what he meant. Well, in Ephesians chapter two, he gives us a very good description of what exactly he means. And I might add that this is a very representative view of Jewish people in the first century. Ephesians two, verse 12. Now this is Paul talking to Gentiles. Remember, that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, Gentiles were excluded from the covenants, the promises, and that meant that they had no hope. Now this is now being contrasted with the gospel, which means that they are no longer strangers, no longer without hope, and um, they are experiencing God's gift of grace, his loving kindness in the gift of his son. And of course, for Paul, the true grace of God is revealed in the death of Jesus. And through Jesus, the Gentiles were now being invited to share in the blessings of the Jewish people. Paul does want to tell us though what he believes back in Galatians chapter two. And in verse 16, we read this. We're not going to be able to go through every verse, but we'll pick out the key verses and uh, discuss them just a little bit. So in Galatians two, verse 16, just to, to refresh our memories. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. What Paul seems to be doing is separating what we believe from what we do, or perhaps to be contrasting belief and faith with the works of the law. And he makes the declaration that the doing of the works of the law or that which the law requires cannot justify you. It is not a path to salvation. It is not the entrance into the people of God. But let me challenge you just for a moment, talking about the works of the law. Doing what God's law required of you was actually what marked the Jewish people as distinct from the nations. Today in, in Christian church, we have such a knee jerk reaction against legalism and works based faith that we fail to note that the gospel requires that we live a very different life from the world. And if the life that we live by faith in the son of God does not look different from the life that is lived by those in the world, then what's the point? Back in, um, Galatians. Of course, I think there's a, a, a traditional view that we think Paul was speaking to those of the circumcision party saying, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot be justified because you keep God's law. And what he was saying to the Gentiles was, 
acceptance into the people of God is now by spiritual birth. It's no longer only by physical birth. But another way of looking at it is that Paul was saying that they were wrong to insist that faith in Christ had to be combined with obedience. And I'm talking about ritual obedience to the rituals of the law in order to secure salvation. Because as we've seen, James in his letter challenges us that if faith doesn't have the fruit of works, if faith doesn't demonstrate itself through action, then faith is dead. I was reading Tom Wright um, today and I, he said something quite helpful. Um, in Galatians 2.16, we talk about, uh, Paul says, we're not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the faith, that, that phrase, through faith in Jesus Christ, can also be translated through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, that changes the meaning of the verse just a little. So the passage could be read, we know a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through the faithfulness of Jesus, the Messiah. And I actually really like that because justification is a work of God. It's not something that we do. And when we talk about we're justified through faith, that is our action. Our faith justifies us because we believe it. But as Tom Wright points out, we're justified because of the faithfulness of Jesus to die on the cross and to pay the debt for sin. And I think what that does is separates out the work of God from the whole process of what it means to be born again and to put your faith in God. I think for me, there is a challenge with scripture that it's not always as linear. It's not always as clear cut or logical as we would like it to be. That, that we can, it's like a, um, a jewel with all these different facets. And when the light shines through it one way, you see certain colors. And when it comes through another angle, you see different colors and the different refractions. And I think that um, for me, what Paul wants or appears to be doing is he says he's against the works of the law. And I can't imagine for a moment Paul was ever against the Torah, his law. But I do think that he was against them being used as a path to salvation or a way by which people could enter into or become part of the people of God. And I'm sure Jewish people in the first century never considered um, this as something that they saw as a possibility. But I'm sure he would absolutely agree with James that faith is evidenced by our actions. So I'm gonna say that again. Paul wants to show that the works of the law are negative if they're being used as the path or the means to salvation and entrance into the people of God. Because Paul could never have disagreed with James's statements. So what are we now trying to gonna make of Paul's claim that he has died to the law in order to live for God? So if I've just said that Paul could never have ditched the law and said that it was bad. Why does he now say that he's died to the law in order that he might live for God? Well, let's remember that Paul was on the fast track to becoming a real man of power in the Jewish religious world. He would most likely have become possibly even the head of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He trained with the great Gamaliel. For him, the law, the study of the law was his life. It was his all consuming passion. So when Paul said that he died to the law, 
What I believe he's saying is the law was no longer to be the final authority in his life. Why? Because he'd met the risen Jesus. He had to rethink his whole understanding, his whole relationship with the law and to God. And so he pictures it as death and rebirth. Paul could never, as I've said, have believed the law was no longer important or that it was no longer the means by which God had revealed himself to the Jewish people or the covenant framework within which this covenant people were to live. But now he had to allow himself, and I, and I think this must have been quite difficult for him. What he had to do was allow himself to have the freedom to live for God in a new way. And he describes this as a life of faith in the Son of God. A relationship based on what Jesus, the Son of God, had done for him. And I think interestingly, what Paul has done is show the Jewish people that they, along with the Gentiles, now come to God in the same way. So whether Jew or Gentile, they're they have to walk through the same door. And that door is dying to whatever has held the greatest authority in, in their life so that they can live for God. For Paul, he had to die to the law as his final authority because Jesus had to be his final authority. Those who'd come from pagan uh, faiths had to die to their pagan faith relationships in order to live for Jesus. And I think that the challenge for us even today is that we have to die to all those things that set themselves above Jesus as the final authority in our lives. Nothing has really changed. Paul says something very much the same in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to one another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So it's really interesting that Paul assumes that faith bears fruit for God. And for, for Paul... Um, fruit, I think here equals obedience to the teachings of Jesus. And so where in the past, the highest authority for Paul was the law and the works of the law were the evidence of that. He now sees the highest authority in the life of the believer as Jesus and obedience to the commands, the instructions of Jesus as the evidence of that relationship in our lives. I was reading um, Douglas Moo on this, and uh, he was saying that we really shouldn't move on from this thought without acknowledging how profoundly shocking it must have been for Jewish people in the first century to hear the things that the Apostle Paul was writing. The idea that you would die to the law, that you would in any way relinquish it as your final authority when it was that very law that makes you the people of God in order to be born again must have been, well, profoundly disturbing and very difficult to grapple with. But he says that this is what must happen in order for you to be able to live for God and more specifically to live for the Messiah. So Paul not only speaks about dying to the law, but more specifically, he talks about being crucified with Christ. When you consider the Jewish implications of having contact with the dead and becoming unclean, this makes it a rather remarkable statement that we might miss in English simply because we hear it so often. But what Paul is doing is making the crucifixion a metaphor. And what he's saying is that the body that has been ruled by sin must die to sin and be reborn to be ruled by Christ. 
And I think he connects this thought after a little detour at the beginning of chapter three to chapter three and verse five, and that is the connection to the life of the spirit. So we read in Galatians three, verse five, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? I think anybody who knows me probably knows where I'm going next. Um, I'm sure Ida knows where I'm going. And that is Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I remove from you the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is the new covenant promise. The promise of the spirit who will empower us to do not the works of the law, but to live our life in the Son of God, to allow the Son of God, to allow Jesus to rule and reign in us, for him to be our highest authority. And we need that connection between the life of the Spirit and God's Word so that we can move forward. And I think for us as believers tonight, if we want to um, live for Christ, if we want, if we're willing to be crucified with Christ, we must allow whatever has been in the past, our guiding principle, whatever seeks to impose its will on us over the word of God, those are the things that we must die to. But I also believe that we cannot do it without the life of the Spirit. And that really what the Apostle Paul has done for us is highlight um, the true meaning of being justified by faith. And I'm going to read to you what that I found that statement again. The source of justification is determined by God. And that was Jesus on the cross. The act of justification is performed by God. And that is Jesus on the cross. The fruit of justification is produced by God. And that is actually done by the work of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus becomes the highest rule and authority in our lives and when obedience to his word demonstrates that we are his people we are not um, wanting in any way to suggest that works or actions contribute to salvation no they're just the evidence of our faith so i hope it's um been a little bit enlightening or given you a different perspective on it tonight and i hope that you'll join us next week as we move further into Galatians chapter 3.